Live. Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we kick off what we're calling the Groovy Horror Retrospective, a look at classic horror of the 60s and 70s. We've also tried to think of other things to call this retrospective. We've thought for a minute that we could call it hippie horror. We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen in this retrospective, so maybe it won't be all hippies, but it's definitely going to be groovy. The first one, we are kicking it off with the original 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Two words, chainsaw, because you can't fit all that energy in just one word. Bear in mind, if you, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it. So, warning, spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, creator of the Alex Van Helsing novels. With me from Austin is Tony Salvaggio, lead singer of the band Deserts of Mars, and co-creator of the comic Psycom from Tokyo Pop and Clockworks from Humanoid. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin is Mr. Drew Edwards, creator and writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man from Monster Vergus Comics. Say hello. Tonight we are all a family of Draculas. <laughs> family of Draculas. Isn't that great? <laughs> also in Austin, special guest Jamie Barr, a musician, pinup model, educator, and lead vocalist and upright bassist for Austin's premier all-female rock and roll band, Danger Cakes, where you can find info on their latest album, Dessert First, for, oh wait, I'm sorry, their new album, titled Quarter Life wow. <laughs> with, Right, which comes in December, so next month. DangerCakes.net is where you can find out about that. Say hello, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. <laughs> hello and welcome back. Okay, according to Wikipedia, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a 1974 American slasher film directed and produced by Toby Hooper, who co-wrote it with Kim Henkel. The, ki- the film follows a group of friends who fall victim to a family of cannibals while on their way to visit an old homestead. It was marketed as a true story to attract a wider audience and as a subtle commentary on the era's political climate, its plot is, plot is completely fictional. However, the character of Leatherface and minor plot details were inspired, and we might debate about this, by the crimes of real-life murderer Ed Gein. So, um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was banned outright in several countries. A lot of theaters stopped showing the film in response to complaints. It was... Um, Let's see, it drew a mixed reception from critics. I, one of my favorite critics, Danny Peary, found it virtually unwatchable. A lot of them did. It made over $30 million at the domestic box office, and it has since gained a reputation as one of the best horror films in cinema history. It is credited with originating, sev- originating several elements common in the slasher genre, including the use of power tools as murder weapons and big, hulking, masked, faceless killers. So... That was a lot. That was a longer introduction than I normally do. And I much apologize, but I thought there were some good points to sort of bounce off of in the beginning there. Let's get our first impressions, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Let's go uh, Tony, Jamie, Drew, who I think uh, really campaigned for us to do this movie, and then I'll say something. So, um, Tony, first impressions. Also, we'd love to hear when you saw this movie, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, it's, I mean, it's definitely a classic. You know, I didn't see it until way late. Um, my parents were not about it. I think I think the legend of it preceded, you know, that was that I think I think that's common for a lot of people. I think the legend of how gory and awful it is and just you know oh it's based on a thing that happened like the the fact it's called the Texas Chainsaw Massacre right. really lends some kind of mystique and terrible power that it wouldn't maybe have been if it would just been called Leatherface, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think all of that, I didn't see it. Till, I can't remember when I saw it, but I was, it might not even been until college, but also I, you know, I found in horror, I didn't really like, even though it's not that it felt like the predecessor of, you know, what we now would call like torture porn mm. because of the scenes that you see and everything like that, that, I, you know, it it just seemed like it was going to be way worse than it did. So I wasn't really interested in the fact, like, because it had this mystique, um, it didn't sound like something I really wanted to check out for a long yeah. time. And then you realize, well, how groundbreaking it is. When I saw it, I was like, oh, I get it. I get why it's popular. I get why it was so groundbreaking at the time, uh, what all it 
did and what all it led to, um, as well as, you know, the, the movies that it kind of stems from, especially like, you know, Night of the Living Dead. There's some yes. great shots kind of almost lifted from that that, you know, really great. Um, Can you name a shot lifted from Night of the Living Dead? I'm trying um, to think. Uh, and I saw it. I'm, I apologize. I'm drawing a blank. But, it, like, I don't know. just some of the uh, the angles and the way that they filmed around the house, and yeah, actually, you can, come there, to think it, of it, some of the stuff it's around in the, 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 you know, some of the shots, maybe not directly, but they're influenced by it, like in you know, the cemetery scenes and the way that they're, you know, some of the close-ups are shot and, you well, know, and the stuff fact like that. that. The house is out in the middle of, out in the middle of a field of sorts, um, and it's abandoned. You know, there are places, times when they're running around an abandoned house that feels very like the early moments of Night of the Living Dead, in fact. The, but I, the, that's, a, that's a really good point. The radio chatter as well feels very much yes. like the news chatter oh, God. Uh, in Night of the Living Dead in, in, in huge ways. And I don't, you know, some of that's just the way that news chatter is, and it's of a time. But also, you know, I think there's there's bits in there as well, um, yeah. definitely influenced. And, you know, that's that's cool. I mean, that's, that you know, in, in commentaries and other bits you can find around, uh, you know, there's a documentary on the, you know, the really cool Blu-ray that, you know, it's it's definitely Night of the Living Dead and stuff like that kind of paved the way for a Texas Chainsaw Massacre where it wasn't, you know, Dracula said in, you know, the past or, right. you know, right. or, you know, it had a very in the now kind of feeling. And, yes. you know, this definitely is a very in the now, you know, just even from, you know, you look at of the time, you know, they pick up a hitchhiker, which you're like, they're like oh, we should pick him up. And now it's like, no way. Yeah, it's picking very up a hitchhiker. Time. Possibly yeah. poss- because you're afraid you're going to pick up a guy who's going to knife himself and you know and your uh, wheelchair ridden friend as well. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a re- it's a really good point. I I wonder if our fear of hitchhikers has anything to do with the popularity of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, well, there's Jamie. a bunch of other stuff, but that's you know. It. But I you know, it's when you watch it. It definitely you can see why it is the phenomena that it is. Even Absolutely. though you know some of it gets kind of dated, we wouldn't have a lot of the things that we have now in the horror genre were it not for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <clears throat> Outstanding. Um, that's a good kickoff, Jamie. Um, I don't know how many times you've seen this, but first impressions. Twice. <laughs> twice. I- I've seen it twice, um, but I, I actually like the movie. Uh, it's I know some people either love it or absolutely hate it, and I'm kind of more on the like side than you know dislike. But um, I watched it actually on a, just one of those things that I said I'd never done, so I decided to do one rainy afternoon um, all by myself and. Yeah, I was. I went into it thinking this is going to be terrifying, and I was actually really shocked about how arty it was. And huh. I was like, "This is really like an art house flick." And I felt like it was more of like a political commentary about the industrialization of America, and yeah, you know how. Yeah. And I thought it was it was kind of an interesting commentary, you know, about the. You know, white collar workers moving in, and um, technology being the end of you know labor for or work for you know Americans, and you know the even just the whole idea of like the slaughterhouses itself, um, you know, and the beef raised in America, and yeah, that's the the almighty beef. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, you know, that whole thing, I just thought it was quite interesting that somebody would kind of focus that on aspect Absolutely. of it, you know, and kind of bring that on like into the the back line of a story for something that was horror related. So, you know, everyone just I just always I guess assumed it was just going to be like straight up torture. <laughs> and it is. It's pretty it's pretty torturous. <laughs> There's, you know, I have to say, after you watch it, it sticks with you. You can still, I feel like you can hear uh, hear the screaming for a while afterwards because it's and that pretty damn relentless. Sound effect that goes, <laughs> that's yeah. Oh, creepy. that's horrible. Whatever the hell that is, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, my a rusty not. piece of machinery. Whatever. 
Yeah, my cats were having none of that when that was. They were like, "Why was? This, why is this going on?" <laughs> what what is that around. sound? It's, there's this astonishing, just whining, whinging thing that just goes <laughs> periodically, and it's, it's just his. It's his like strike key. You know how other movies will do this. Bum, bum. He uses that, and it's just truly, truly unnerving. Um, thank you very much, Jamie. Drew, this movie's your fault. Um, what, uh, tell me. Two, two weeks in a row, the movie is my fault. And, and, and I want to say the two movies are Beetlejuice and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which are classics. Uh, but they're my fault. Your fault is a kind of like, <laughs> yeah. it's all on you. Thanks for making uh, us watch, like, groundbreaking films, you jerk. Yeah, no, I, I, I actually am very thankful that, that, that it's true. Uh, I'm very thankful well, you did. Well, so, yeah, tell us. Tell you're us. welcome. Uh, by the way, uh, <laughs> I first saw this movie when I was seven or eight, oh, and I watched man. it with my dad. <laughs> I I love my my dad and I are very very different people, but we do both share the love of of the horror genre, and in many ways, um, he is the guy that introduced me to. He's the one you know. I talked about this a lot way back when we did The Omen. Um, you know, he was the one that allowed me to, to get into these movies at an early age. And, um, you know, my older brother had rented it and, you know, my mom was very skeptical about me watching it and I was terrified. And I still think this is, you know, one of the most terrifying movies ever made. In fact, I, I purposely only watch it once a year because I don't want to become desensitized to it. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, we, we, Tony was talking about its relation to the so-called torture porn films. This is, this is the genesis of that, but this is a much more elegant movie. And I know that people oh, always think that that's yeah. a strange thing to say about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it is more so than just, you know, arterial spray in your face. This is barraging you with disturbing and weird imagery in the most un-Hollywood way yeah. fashion. You know, you guys were just talking about, like, the choice of sound effects. And, like, even Leatherface, like, if you look at Leatherface's evolution as, like, a pop culture figure, you know, the masks that they've given him through the various sequels and remakes have gotten more elaborate. But I don't think that any of them ever are quite as terrifying as they are in here. And indeed, Leatherface is actually extremely hard to look at at times. Yes. And I, I say as I've grown into a man, you know, I, I actually am still currently uh, as a day job. I, I work with meat. <laughs> I've been a butcher uh, I, I now I now work within the selling of, of meat, uh, so right. I have a certain affinity for that aspect of this movie because uh, professionally I have uh, I have made quite a bit of money off of uh, off of meat. So I, I in fact uh, I did actually try as I was saying before we started recording I did actually try to pitch a Texas Chainsaw Massacre comic book to Wildstorm at one point. And I, uh, part of my pitch included, I'm uniquely qualified to write this because I am a butcher and I am from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you just wander around on the road and flail around. Yeah. You know, <laughs> as, you, as, you, as you want to do. <laughs> just making noises. By the way, that's one, one year I, I could... did dress as, as Leatherface for Halloween and I had a, a bloody smock from work. So oh, there you go. Oh, oh boy. Oh, boy. There you go. What is the uh, what, what is the bag that the hitchhiker wears? He has a bag that seems to be made out of a fox, maybe a cat. It's hard to say. Oh uh, well, I think with as far as like what roadkill he's gotten, yeah, I think it's kind of just a could be a squirrel. My, I mean, who knows? I think it's just kind of whatever he could sew together. Good <laughs> golly. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Drew. I I I will only say a few words because you guys have pretty much nailed it up that. This is a very, very solid, this is an almost perfect horror film. It's not, you know, I'm always the guy who's like really into, uh, you know, very elegant horror and, 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 you know, a lot of gothic horror. That's my bag, okay? But I have a big fondness for grungy horror of the 60s and 70s. And this is some of the, this is like 
as far as grungy horror goes, this is like the most skillful, most beautifully made grungy horror ever. It is torture porn without gore, which is astonishing. There are moments, you know, where it is so intense and so hard to watch, and that's going to be our first topic, that you that it is very hard to keep your eyes on, and yet all of the that there is it is an almost bloodless movie that's the thing that that people you know like the the probably the bloodiest thing that happens is early on when a, a demented hitchhiker cuts himself on the hand with a pocket knife that's that's about as bloody as this movie gets it is just extremely uncomfortable to look at and and amazing uh so it's very 70s i really kind of wish that i could kind of could get a look could get out and walk around Central Texas of 1974. You know, I, I wished I could follow their van back to downtown Austin and see what Austin was like in '74 because they're they're driving around, you know, Round Rock basically. They're they're just sort of sort of north of Austin, knocking around, and um, and I spent a good long time there. So so you know, I I really enjoyed seeing a vision of Texas at this point trapped um, right at the end, you know, at the end of the, the Vietnam era. So. Um, well, I like when you mention grungy, because yeah. watching the panel, which, by the way, you know, we should probably repost the panel, the part of the panel I caught at House yes. Horror, Horror Festival. Uh, you know, they said, you know, when they went to, because you know, they got the same, the cinematographer to shoot the new, the, you know, new 20, what, 13 Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or was it? Yeah, I think so. Whatever it was. Um, anyway, <laughs> they said, well, hey, we want to have that look. And he's like, so you want me to shoot on 16 millimeter? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. no, that would be like we don't want you to do that. And he's like, well, if you want it, <laughs> if you want to look you want like that, that sort of exposure <laughs> and that sort of grain, like that's that sort what of we did. But that's... they were just like, what? We're not, we're this is a multi-million dollar film. We can't possibly sh- that that. Why are you telling us this? He was like, well, you ask how to make it look like that. I'm telling you that. <laughs> yeah. There's the secret. It's no secret. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, uh, you just nailed something right there, which is that, you know, look, I, it's true when this movie came out, there were a lot of bad reviews, but there were a lot of people who instantly recognized it as art. And Toby Hooper was doing something really amazing. But the biggest one that people complained about right at the beginning is just how incredibly intense it is. Um, I, I, I mean, uh, okay, I'll say something about this, and then you guys react because with – with another example, because I'm not sh- quite sure where to dive into this, but I'll say this: once, uh, once you get to the point where Sally, the main character, has like wandered into, which is like wait, late, late in the the movie builds over a long period, but sure. what everybody remembers is that last like half hour when <laughs> yeah. you are just basically she is screaming for half an hour. And it is just relentless, and you just feel really pummeled by the by the film. I mean, uh, did did you guys did did you guys experience this? And and did you find yes? It- <laughs> I had ter- I when we watched it the other night. I just had terrible nightmares of like people's body parts. <laughs> like, <they're, laughs> like that was one thing for some reason. Even though you don't really see a lot of body parts throughout the movie. I feel like most yeah. of the gore is in like the very beginning when you're seeing the the pictures. What you're yeah, yeah, actually yeah. And that's a... mention, the way this movie kicks off is you've got this business of it, it took me like several viewings to understand how this works plot wise. The movie kicks off with a discovery that somebody's been messing around with Graves in this um central central Texas community and has desecrated a bunch of graves, stolen graves, wired them up, posed them, done all kinds of, of crazy stuff like that. And that's been in the news. And so people are coming from miles around to visit graveyards to see if their graves have been desecrated. That's why a bunch of hippies come from Austin uh, in a van to go check out the grave of their, uh, you know, there's a couple named Sally and, and Franklin. Uh, I mean, there are a couple of siblings, Sally and Franklin and their friends are in a van, and they've come to check out whether their grandparents' graves have been desecrated. That's the point. It took me forever to get that all of the artsy stuff that Toby Hooper begins with, with these amazing flash 
images where light will come on and show a body that's disintegrating, you know, in the sun, and then the light will go back off. It took forever for me to, to recognize that that was actually part of the plot and not just some extremely artistic opening credit sequence. Um, yeah, I, I took it as like a, you know, like a newspaper, you know, found this at, in the middle of the night and, you know, these are the well, it also the pieces ties back to the hitchhiker. Saw. Oh, sorry. It also ties back to the hitchhiker as a flash Polaroid. That's um, right. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's, this, the sound is that, that's the same, the camera sound. Yeah, yeah. And he's yeah, also, uh, we get the impression he's responsible for some of this too because right, they're like, on. hey, why are you messing, you know. Why are you doing that? The family's kind of a problem. I told you to stop messing them around in those cemeteries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But so, I feel like this, the hitchhiker character is, like you said before, is I feel like everyone probably had to hear some sort of horror story about a hitchhiker growing up to, you know, yeah, instill so, in them not to pick up a hitchhiker because this is what could happen. <laughs> well, know. yeah, so they, they do. They, so these hippies, uh, forgive me for calling them hippies, they're some, they're, but they're not town folk because they're, they've come from Austin. The, these, these guys have driven into this small community to check out uh, the grave. And, of course, at the grave, everybody there is country folk. They're all wearing their cowboy hats. Which, by the way, my grandfather wore his cowboy hat all the time. You know, that's this is the way that men dressed. So they're in the country, and they clearly are standing out because they're hippies who, who very probably come from the University of Texas, just like the actors who played them are. And they, but they're Texan uh, hippies. They all have Texas accents, which is kind of awesome. And uh, they stand out like a sore thumb. So they, they, you know, they, they don't find anything interesting around their own grave. So they figure they'll go check out the house. And um, I'm going to skip over their visiting the, uh, the, the gas station because, re- really, they, they go to the gas They don't know this guy's important. They go to the gas station and they get a warning, oh, you shouldn't go checking around houses. So they, the, gas, the gas station's important because that's where they sell the barbecue. Well, that's true. Yeah. That, is, that is quite true. They, they meet this kind of friendly-ish guy who runs the gas station that says, you know, you shouldn't go messing around, uh, you know, at little houses like you're telling me you're going to do. Why don't you hang out here and wait for gas? This is another really key component here because it's 1974. There's a gas crisis on. So there's, they haven't, this gas station has not gotten its delivery of gasoline yet. So this could happen. You could go to a gas station. There's no gas. You know, there's a horrible energy crisis at the time. President Nixon, just two years before this, asked people to please not burn Christmas lights during Christmas because we wanted to conserve energy. If you if you ever wonder what that's like, this happened not long ago. <laughs> we, we had a horrible, horrible energy crisis in the United States. So and you had these lines around the block because gas stations would finally get gas, and you'd have to like line up like for miles. So that's what's going on at this time. But think about this guy. This guy, his livelihood is running a gas station and selling barbecue, and he's got no gasoline. So next, they meet a guy on the road, a hippie, oh, well, sort of a grungy, um, vaguely disfigured. He has a disfiguring raspberry mark on his on his cheek um, guy with a Polaroid camera who hitches a ride, and we learn that he was part of the meat industry around here, which also has been devastated. So the gas station guy has no gasoline, and the meat guy has no meat because he has been put out of work because of the industrialization of slaughtering beef. We get all of this in a very skillful sort of exposition scene that happens inside of, inside of a van. Um, the, the old way is, it was, was better. Yes, yes. Yeah. This guy comes across completely demented. He talks in this sort of, sort of stilted, vaguely, you know, developmentally delayed kind of talk, which, by the way, he does not have later on when he turns up. When he turns up again, he no longer stutters and, 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 um, and acts like he barely understands what people are saying to him. Um, so I, I, and I don't know what to make of that. I don't know if, if it's just an inconsistency or what. Maybe or when he's around his family, he's kind of like, he's all, he's not out of sorts. I think that's possible. I think that's really possible. Yeah. 
But these guys pick up this this hitchhiker, and they're going to give him a ride, but they're immediately freaked out by him because he starts talking about how he was the guy who used to bash cow's skulls and how the the air gun um, has put them out of work. It's exactly what drew exactly what you were talking about. And they go, well, we've heard, we heard it was really humane. Okay. And there's politics in here. You got to tell me what you think about this, Drew, because there's there's politics here. Because they say to him, hey, well, we heard that air that the air gun is a more humane way of killing cattle. And he's like, well. That's interesting, but anyway, we're all out of work, and that's to me. There's something really in there, you know, in in that notion that that these are people who relied on this industry being a certain way for a long time, and now technology is just sort of leaving them behind. Um, why are we? Why is he doing all this stuff with meat? What is Toby Hooper? Is there? Is is this? What's going on? Because people interpret it different ways. Is is this about Vietnam? Is it about um, modernization? Is it about hippies not understanding the way the world actually works? I mean, what what's going on here? Well, you know, the way I always interpreted it, this movie is mostly it's 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 somebody who's lived both in an extremely rural community. And, you know, somebody who's lived a good portion of my life now in, in very urban population centers. I've always interpreted this movie as kind of a, or a, or an urban, you know, a class, a class warfare kind of thing. And what the way, you know, upper upper class intellectuals might. Right. This is a nightmare version of, of the blue collar. And, yeah. and, you know, and specifically, you know, well, Everybody, you know, or not everybody, but quite the majority of the population eats meat. They don't really want to think about where where we get it from, and that's something I've personally experienced a lot in my professional life. Is that you know, people kind of if they learn you work with meat, they start to kind of think that you're you might possibly be a little a little shady or a little icky. Now, and Jamie and I talked about this extensively after we watched it. She um. You know, and she'll she she can chime in on this. You know, she she brought up you know how this could be seen as a a metaphor for the industrial revolution, and I'm sort of slapping myself for never thinking of it that way. Yeah, the problem is like I think all of this are things you can do, but just from watching interviews and from watching them on stage and stuff, I think a lot of like a lot of groundbreaking movies, people have ascribed a larger metaphor and a larger importance to this. Like, there's pieces of that, but in general, we forget that people just want to make a movie. Like, yeah. a lot of it, if you watch a lot of the stuff, there's a lot of like, hey, I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> I wish I had been so clever as that, you know. So, so like, you're that saying been, But I don't, think, I don't think that it's wrong to, to see things in that, even if no, no, it's I a think filmmaker that's great. What I'm saying is, the filmmaker didn't didn't necessarily go, yes, this is sticking it to the man uh, for Vietnam, or it's the the class struggle, like the art part of that has it, you know. You know, and again, possible, like it, no, like, I, I it understand just, what you're saying, but I'm saying it doesn't necessarily make it wrong to see those things in it. Because, no, of course not. Of you course know, not. the view the viewer is part of the movie. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that the rumor of all of that gets mixed up like that's a that's ancillary to the actual to creation of the thing yeah if you we're know? actually if we're trying to figure out like what actually went into the making of it what was toby hooper thinking i've i've read some things where toby hooper was mainly just thinking about the world the, the worst the most detailed he got was he may not have said this is about class struggle but he did feel like this is about the world falling apart like he sure, felt as though sure. the world, like this was a nightmare of the world falling apart. And there's a moment later on, what's so touching to me about when Marilyn Burns, who plays Sally, our main character, our final girl, when she's been captured, um, she tries to reason with these people, which is fascinating to me. You know, again, we've just talked about some things that made them victims. This family out here in this country home, they're, you know, the industry they were a part of has fallen apart. The industry that they've latched on to, which is to say selling gasoline, also falling apart. So they have problems. Having said Absolutely. that, they are demented people. And there's a yeah. point where she tries to reason with them, where she goes, you don't have to do any of this. 
and they they're 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 really sadistic. I mean, they're really, well, they're you know, family yeah. traditions are family traditions. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we all have ours. Um, I think it goes back to what Drew was talking about that how how fitting. Uh, not to steal it, Drew, but I think you brought up a good point. How fitting that this is so close to Thanksgiving. <laughs> right. Well, this is this is in, a, in its way a perfect Thanksgiving movie. Yes. <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, Drew posted a cartoon actually of somebody putting on the Leatherface costume and carving up a turkey with a chain. Oh, I'm like, glad you found that. I said that last night. <laughs> I said I wonder if this, that would be a perfect meme. <laughs> well, legend has it that after wrapping, um, and Harry's told it several times. Harry Knowles of Ain't It Cool News, they came and visited him with a, you know, toy chainsaw, and he cut his birthday cake with it. Like, oh, <laughs> that's funny. And, you yeah, know, I mean, kind of a few retellings or whatever, but it's always the common thread is, you know, you met, the, you met them, and, you know, they came, they because they were shooting right around here. Well, it's and sort of so, remarkable that a chainsaw, a chainsaw, which is the weapon that's used by, by the uh, main antagonist of the movie, a Leatherface, Chainsaw had never, that I'm aware of, been used as a, a maniac weapon in a movie before. Maniacs had used buzz saws. You know, you would tie up, you know, Polly Pureheart and tie her to some sort of thing that's carrying a bunch of boards toward a buzz saw. But never somebody picking up a saw and running around with it, which is kind of funny because you'd think somebody would have thought of that by now. It, um, it, it, it really is... Uh, very frightening because ever since then, think how you go to any haunted house, right? And there's always the room with the flashing strobes, and the guy with the leather face comes out, and he's got a chainsaw. Usually, it's actually a real chainsaw where they just remove the chain, so the thing rattles at you, which yeah. is really, pretty, honestly, still pretty intimidating. Um, okay, so uh, I sh- we should mention the the group here. The, there are some very interesting characters here. These are not just a bunch of pretty people getting chopped up by, you know, Freddy Krueger or whatever. They're really interesting. I mean, considering, you know, how how early this film is in in Hooper's career, um, is this just, this isn't his first movie, is it, or is it? It's a second movie. Second movie. All right. Look, it is really fascinating the way they've divided up these characters. That you've got this brother and sister pair. The brother having been. You know, he's, he's, we don't know why he's a paraplegic. We don't know if he's been injured or, well, no. They make reference to that he was probably crippled as a child as well. So you have the brother who's in a wheelchair. But more than that, not only is he a brother in a wheelchair, but he is a conniving, whining, mean-spirited, bitter brother in a wheelchair that they <laughs> haul around with this sort of intense feeling of, of, sympathy and just sort of their their personal duty and it's fascinating and what a great character i mean i was th- this is way more character than you would expect to get in any in in any movie certainly not the kind of movie that people talking about the Texas Ch- chainsaw massacre make it seem because this this franklin guy is really unusual i mean you like him and you hate him and and you know uh you even feel in the end in a way you can't wait for the movie to get rid of him which is interesting you know um i have to say the other uh, the the two guys are more or less interchangeable to me i can't really tell much difference between kirk and jerry you know other than one well, jerry kind of looks like <laughs> yeah jerry kind of looks like disco stew from the sunset <laughs> right. hey dad <laughs> no that's true they do look different but i mean they're they're more or less interchangeable you know uh, UT, UT intellectual hippie types. Um, and then you've got, you know, the, what sets Sally apart among the two girls is her, her sympathy and her sweetness towards her brother, which is just really interesting, you know, and her extraordinary patience in dealing with him because he's such an incredible whiner. Um, it, it's, it's just really interesting. There's there's dynamics going on here that indicates that Toby Hooper, you know, and I I guess I should uh, actually he has a co-writer, which is uh, Kim Henkel. So you know maybe it's the both of them. But there's there's these are some interesting characters. And then basically as soon as they've got them set up and out in the middle of nowhere where um, 
you know, two by two, they go off to investigate around and they run across this little farmhouse. When the killer, Leatherface, finally makes his appearance, it is an astonishing moment that I, I, it's hard to describe. Who wants, <laughs> Drew, you want to give us the, <laughs> the first appearance of Leatherface? Well, one of the one of the one of the guys walks into the this astounding old country house, the, finding it. Uh, they're, they're looking for. I think they're looking. Oh, they they think that they may have gas because they have yeah, a generator. They're, they're looking and, for gas. And he, he knocks on the door. Cars, by the way. And um, ab- there's tons of abandoned cars. There's there's actually a lot of of warning signs saying, "Hey, don't." You know, you really have yeah. to question the intelligence of this guy because, you know, once he enters the house, the house is this, you know, even at the, the little bit of the hallway, the house is this ramshackle haunted mansion you know, with like taxidermy and, you know, bones everywhere. And right. he walks down the hall and he's, he's, you know, hollering for somebody. And there is a large metal door like, like you would see in an old butcher shop. And in fact, the very first butcher shop I ever worked in had a door just like this and the door moves open and this large man in a in a homemade gimp mask comes out and and clubs him in with with, clubs his head in with a hammer a swell squealing like a pig right yeah not just moves like it slides like yeah like i mean it's one of the most memorable you know door openings possible in film <laughs> and there's no <laughs> just there's like no, out of the blue you know there's no music there's no nothing it's just one minute kirk is just walking around and then the door opens and this giant guy walks out and goes Wonk. and kirk what i find most fascinating is kirk hits the ground and starts shaking uncontrolled of course because he's is just going through these, auto, <laughs> these, these, these automatic nervous responses as his and so the big guy has to whack him a couple more times. It is it is really, really wild. I mean, and I, I don't think I'd ever seen anything like this the first time I saw it. You know, they, I I can't think it's very rare in a movie that you hit you have to hit somebody again if you're killing them, you know? Most people they get knifed once or hit once or, or or shot once and they just go down, you know. So it's rare that somebody would go down and still keep keep just sort of squirming around. Um and that's when you know that, you know, <laughs> you are totally not safe in this movie. Although, of course, you probably knew that walking in because it's called the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, and you know, but but still, it, you know, Rob Zombie made the point where he said that it felt watching this movie like you weren't watching actors. It felt like somehow you were just magically following real people around in a, in a very strange um, situation. Well, so right, even, yeah. um, on the documentary, there's even a part where uh, I think it's Marilyn Burns is talking about acting opposite the actor playing Frankie and how she didn't really have to act because he was so convincing as this whiny like guy. Like you kind of just reacted to that character. Oh, that's good. Franklin, as, yeah. Like she said, she you know he didn't have to really act because it didn't feel like acting because of there's just the way he portrayed the character and everything. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, you know, there, the chemistry that you see, it works, you know. Yeah. Um, and there's not always that on a, you know, you don't always get that kind of chemistry, but it works really well here. And it's just because of, you know, it's one of those, another one of those kind of perfect storm things where he was just, you know, he locked into that and then she got to kind of work off of that. I thought that was really interesting. It, this is an amazing guy. I, I haven't. I know he's been in other movies. I haven't seen him in anything else. But he um, he was from Texas. He was at UT. He uh, had been. Um, I think he'd been in Vietnam himself. You know, and 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 had come. You know, he's not a paraplegic to my knowledge. Uh, I think he's one of the bad guys in in uh, Rolling Thunder, which I've seen, but I don't remember him there. Um, and granted, at the time, you know, you keep coming back to, hey, it's it's hippies, like. That was the thing about UT. UT yeah. was the hippie school. All the crazy business in Texas, you know, right. took place at UT. Like, ah, oh, you don't ever know what's going to happen in Aus- like a UT campus, where right. you know every all the other campuses uh, much more conservative. 
uh, you know, and still are, you know. But definitely UT, having these people come from and kind of be sort of hippie-ish, it all fit. Like, you, if you knew the area, you were like, oh, yeah, those people. You guys have and, come and way too far the north. Same, and the <laughs> same way with when they get to the small town, and it's a much yeah. more conservative town, and they're kind of like, oh, look, some, you know, hippie young kids. Uh, yeah. They kind of have that attitude as well. Uh, you know, it all it all fits that that era. That, you know, those they, they all were kind of archetypes that were very, you know, place specific. Um, well, it's funny and, to me that we don't see, you know, we we just just as in metropolitan, we don't ever see the ballrooms that they're dancing in. We only see the hallways where they hang out between dancing. The same thing here. We don't see UT. You know, um, right? But we don't see Austin. We don't see I thirty five. You know, we. Uh, uh, we just see these well, guys. Well, you know the the way this movie is structured, it's it, you know it's it's actually very fairy tale like. Mm. You know these these kids go out into the woods and they're besieged by ogres. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. Now, does that remind you? I I, I gotta say, Deliverance had come out in 1972, and I, and there's there's that's a very similar picture to this to me. Deliverance, though, this is about kids. And we really like these guys, okay? But Deliverance is about four full, you know, adults who, for fun, decide that they're going to go into a world that they don't completely understand. And, you know, it, it really does a number on all of them. But I think that that, that sort of feel I, – I, I agree with what Tony said, that you can go too far, but I think that this notion of, of you know, uppity city folk – Thinking that they can that they can get by in the country and running into real country folk, I think that is a real theme. What I can't figure out is why is it so important in 1972-74? I mean, what what is that about? I I that's what I don't understand without doing some deeper research. Is what is this great country mouse city mouse thing that's happening at the end of the 60s and the early 70s? You know. Um, if anybody wants to have it a guess, that's great. If not, we can just save it for another time. But I, well, but I, I would know say, there's something going on. I don't, I'm not, obviously, I wasn't born. Um, but, um, I mean, that's kind of like an end of innocence in a way. I mean, it was like the end of the 60s, you know, yeah. Vietnam was still going on. You know, it was the summer of love came and went. And, yeah. you know, we had Woodstock and everything. And, not to mention uh, the moon landing. You know, we we landed on the moon. <laughs> so yeah. there was, I think, in a sense, a different view of and cynicism, maybe even of the well, culture and you know what was going on. <laughs> at well, the yeah, time. That the world is out of control. I think that if you if you put yourself in the in the the because who's going to be watching this in the end? It's like it's suburban types going to their to their drive-ins, and it's city types going to their uh, the grindhouse theaters. So you know, I think to them, there's something also going on in pop culture where where counterculture, which had been the anti-Vietnam and the and all the all the the groovy hippie stuff that was happening in the mid '60s, counterculture had finally made its way all the way to culture. So that your mainstream sitcoms and all that stuff, the housewives started dressing kind of, kind of hippified, you know, and the and the main characters started wearing longer sideburns and all that stuff. And what you're seeing there in the early '70s is the co-opting of hippie culture, you know. And I I think there is probably this notion that if if grown men had looked more or less the same all through the 20th century, all of a sudden everything's very, very different. So maybe that's part of what's going on and, and stuff. Because Deliverance, by the way, the, the real driving plot there is that these guys are going to go canoeing because very soon they're going to put up a dam and drown the entire valley and destroy all these old towns, which these city guys think is a great opportunity to go canoeing. And that's, that's what's going on in the background. And the, and the, the symbolism is, is really so big that it's, it's unavoidable here. I think here it's, you know, the world that we knew has, and we are the family, the world that we knew has fallen away. 
you guys are somehow involved in what's destroyed it. You're somehow involved in the fact that there's no gasoline, and you're somehow involved in the fact that you have a problem with how we used to do uh, industrialized um, meat con- uh, production, and you know, and we have no pity for you. And and, um, and again, now I feel like maybe I'm getting too far afield. And maybe well, I'm- you know, there, you know, the idea of you know the the I hate to get too maybe basic about it, but there's also the idea that, you know, okay, these counterculture people came in and they've taken over and they've kind of feminized the American male. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but these, these people, these people who are out here in the sticks, they are more savage than us. They have not been tamed by the, the, the liberal, the, so the, the, the liberal disease that has now infected America, and these people will rise up and they will literally, literally devour Confused. us. Yeah. And, All right. You know, I I do think that that's part of the the cultural again the the culture war, and you know, I, I maybe that wasn't deliberate on Hooper's part, but I you know it was at least subconscious. It feels pretty deliberate to me. I mean, it really. I I think you just can't escape that stuff. I mean, I think it's. It's clearly it's the it's the country versus city mice. Um, now, what about the whack ass house though? This, this is where it gets really weird because I've met a lot of you know I I know a lot of country folk, you know. But now we get to what makes this family strange, and it is that they <laughs> are they are. This is one of the house is the only thing that makes them strange. <laughs> I think you could put them up in the the Waldorf and they'd still be pretty odd. I think you're you're probably right, but I mean the the thing that amazes me is um when the girl the girl who has the worst ordeal okay uh is she stumbles upon the the ugliest thing that we've seen so I mean we've already seen Leatherface show up and whack Kirk in the head, but when the girl shows up, she stumbles into what's called the bone room, and this is where we see the really strange stuff for the first time it's after Leatherface shows up. You know, we've seen some taxidermy, as you pointed out, and some weird things like that. But now we get into this room where there is chicken feathers all over the floor. And I can't imagine anybody keeping their house where they're, let, they're, let, they're just chicken feathers everywhere. I mean, these guys' allergies must be through the roof. I, I cannot envision it. And then there's <laughs> also furniture made of human parts. So there's uh, – and, and I – it, it, okay, does anybody know how they did this stuff? How did they do it? The, tell me about, like, what I want to know is you've got things like human feet acting as, like, like um, you know, lamp rests and stuff like that. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a pretty good document, like, a, there's a pretty good documentary on the Blu-ray that talks a lot about that and how, you know, what they used to kind of make the mask and how when they dried it, it looked a certain way and everything. Like, I would strongly mask recommend the Blu-ray. So uh, what, are these, what are the bones, though? What, what are the, yeah, what are the these? various bones they got. And then, I mean, it, you know, I it's told better, on, <laughs> like I said, on the documentary. But, like, they go through, hey, we wanted this. And, you know, they, I mean, you can get bones. I mean, if, if you're out and about, you're in an area that does any kind of slaughtering. There's also chicken slaughter and stuff like that. Like bones are. Yeah, but how do you create easy. a human foot? That's what I want to know. Is I mean a skeletal human? Foot. I mean it's a model, clearly. I mean, I, but but the thing is, they look so incredibly real. And that, it, you know, you've got these like this. You've got this astonishing couch that is built out of human bones. In theory, I mean, the, you know. I, you have to keep reminding yourself that what you're looking at is not just some desecration of an actual human skeleton. Well, uh, actually, oh, they weren't human skeletons, but they were actually real animal bones, a lot of I, them. Yeah. Um, because one of the that. makeup artists ha- was a veterinary assistant at the time and gave them monkey bones and uh-huh. basically had like a whole pet cemetery for them to use out back. So the guy oh, who designed yeah. all the furniture and everything went to that area and had a field day <laughs> and then designed pieces of furniture that I guess, I believe it was Toby had kind of 
discuss with him, like, oh, I want a chair that looks like this. And then right. from there you had to figure out, like, well, what could be used as a chair? And they came – I know the totem specifically was something that Toby had, you know, actually requested. <laughs> so, but, you know, it had, like, a rib cage. Are you talking about and, that hangs or, or uh, um, which one – what are you talking about? The lo- I think I I would imagine the large one with in is that the beginning where you when you go up you oh, see yeah, it's that. like yes. at the cemetery. Yeah, that's astonishing. There's this this amazing sort of scarecrow that well, we we come to find out that the hitchhiker is so demented that he's been robbing graves and arranging the bodies in weird ways. And the rest of the which is which is based off of that is stuff you know we're talking about the Ed Geenness that that yeah. is stuff that Ed Gein did do. Yes. Yeah, no, you're right. Hey, did you see, um, there's actually a biography of Ed Gein that, um, starring Steve Railsback that was really yeah. good. Uh, we saw that about like Nomathon. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It was about Nomathon, one, one of those years. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was, and he showed up. He was there. He took questions. And, uh, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Uh, Ed Gein, this Wisconsin farmer, again, one of these guys, you know, sort of, uh, you know, he was totally real, but his story plays into this urban notion that if you get far enough out of town, you don't know what motivates those people. So they might all be doing really cra- truly crazy things. In Ed Gein's case, he was making a woman's suit that he would then put on and go dance around in the moonlight. Astonishing, but true. And that's um, – so, okay, so you've got this bone room where there's all of this furniture made out of human parts. It is an astonishing work of, of design. And she falls and she bangs across the floor and she's knocking into things. And then she tries to escape Leatherface, who, and this is a truly terrifying scene, Leatherface, of course, starts chasing her and she can't get away. And I, I, I have heard that this is one of the most brutal, like, work, brutal jobs that any actor ever had to go through because, you know, this actress um, is, is just doing all these really pain. These are stunts, you know, you're falling all over stuff and you're banging into, into things. And she got hung up on a, she gets hung up on a meat hook at one point. Yeah. And she's actually wearing, she had to wear a harness, but the harness itself was apparently extraordinarily painful to wear. So this, you know, everybody says that this entire, this Toby Hooper shoot was just like the most punching hell that they, well, I kind of wonder if that's why the movie was so pow- is so powerful because the people who who made it were literally in pain. It's possible. It's truly possible. There's a there's a moment later on when they want to get a little bit of blood out of Sally because they have the, the family has captured her and they have a mummified grand well not mummified He's no, you know we, Jason do you really want to do you want to oh we don't have to go there. jump to this or, you, or do you want to talk uh, should, should, uh, I mean well no, I was just you. thinking about the blood but we can save it we can save it so okay. yeah all right so where are we 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 had uh, we we had the girl who gets chased around I I was totally hoping that she would get away there's a point where she like runs out the door this is such an amazing thing how many times do you see this she runs out the door but he manages to catch her like on the front porch, you know, and, and, and drags her back in. Um, her demise is real tough. I mean, but what's amazing, again, you really don't see very much. It's just extraordinarily scary. This is a very, very scary movie that has almost no blood. And the reason why is Toby Hooper was hoping that he could get a PG rating <laughs> if, if he didn't show any blood. This, this blows my mind. That, that he was hoping that the, that the the ratings group would would look at this and go like, well, you know, I guess this can play next to Superman in the mall, you know. Well, so. you know, the funny thing is, you know, in the scene you're talking about, like she's hung up on the hook, she's still alive, you yeah. know. So we we assume that, you know, she will eventually be dispatched, but she's still alive. Well, their face is saving her, and he he revs up this chainsaw. And, you know, you see her boyfriend's corpse and, you know, he starts basically mining this, uh, rending this body with a chainsaw. But you yeah. don't, you don't, it's, it's, it's horrific because she's, you know, she's watching yeah. you know, the reactions of her as she is, 
impaled on a meat hook. Yeah, she she's can't watching. escape this damn this hook. It, yeah, she's watching him hack up her boyfriend. But there's a big the, the the focus of the shot is on a meat grinder, so you don't you don't see anything. It's just Gunnar Hansen pantomiming cutting this guy up, and yeah. it's a hundred percent effective. But it's the sort of trick you would see in like a, a locally run haunted house. Absolutely, yeah, because you 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 never see that chainsaw come anywhere near. Now the actor complained that the chainsaw was still plenty near him, and he was troubled by that. But nevertheless, we as the viewer, because they're not going to bother to give us the special effects of Gunnar Hansen cutting somebody up, all of they that probably didn't done, have the money, <laughs> right? So it's all done by staging it so that we're sort of our the camera is actually under the table and far enough away that the it's framed so that you can't see him cutting anything up. It's amazing. It's really really well uh, well done. But um, yeah, that, that's that is this is extremely this is the stuff that that people thought was sadistic is hanging her on a hook and everything, you know. But it's it's just uh, it's Hooper trying to make you know a plenty scary um, a plenty scary picture. Um, we actually discover her again a few minutes later because now finally uh, the next one Jerry comes in and Jerry. <laughs> Jerry wanders through – at this point, the movie – there is a point where the movie kind of feels almost comic in how everybody keeps wandering into the same traps. Jerry comes in. Um, he finds Pam in the meat locker. No, sorry, in like a – in a, a freezer. Cooler. Yeah, it's a cooler. So she's blue. She's been cold, but she's still alive. And so she tries to get out of the locker, and then Leatherface comes in and – you know, and he basically was like, "Oh, come on!" And so he pushes her back in, and then he he kills Jerry. I don't even remember how he kills Jerry at this point. He hits, her, um, hits him in the head with a hammer too. Oh yeah. So that now, um, more people were always... actually killed with with a hammer in this movie than with a chainsaw. That's right. That's right. Because he kills uh, at least two. He kills only one that we saw with a chainsaw. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely right. There's no reason for this movie to be called the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, other than that, then obviously somebody realized that that chainsaw well, was. Well, we get the impression because they talk about you know so many people get hit in the head and that's a big thing that we can assume that people get clubbed and then chainsawed apart into pieces. I think that's know, right. As I, I, I think that's true. Yeah. Well, he's he's rending these people and, and actually in some places where they, they process um, um, pigs, chainsaws are actually used. Why? Sure. Because it's just so fast, I suppose. Uh, fast and, you know, bone, this is the thing a lot of horror movies forget. Bone is hard to get through. Like oh, when, yeah. when I was a, a butcher for Whole Foods, uh, for many, many years, uh, we used big industrial, uh, like table saws right. to cut right. through, through, yeah. like, so yeah, chain, chainsaw can cut, it makes, makes perfect sense to, as a, as a quick, cheap way to, to outfit, you know, uh, uh, somebody processing meat. I assume that this is a disabled chainsaw because I can't believe that Gunnar Hansen would go running around with one of these things. I mean, surely this is not, uh, you know, it's on, but I, I'm certain they've removed the chain because he runs like crazy with this thing. He's running around the gas station. He's running through fields, and, and I, that's a, it's it's terrifying, and, and I can't believe they would make this actor actually run with a chainsaw. It's a real chainsaw, though, for sure. Um, they put tape over the brand because for some reason they thought it would be inappropriate. Nobody wanted to, to get that free endorsement, I guess. Right. You know, nowadays probably people would be would, would, would go crazy to, to be known as the chainsaw that their face uses. Hey, do you hear a, wait, wait, hang on a second. Do you hear a strange um Hey Tony? I I sorry heard a strange echo. That's very weird. Okay. Well anyway. Um I apologize. This is the kind of thing that we would remove in post if we had a post. Uh, okay, so 
we should get. I think we lost Tony actually, but I think he's going to come back. So, um, all right. So where were we? We we were. Jerry just got. We just got rid of Jerry, and then what happens is, um, wow, it sounds like the sound is is really screwed up. Do you guys hear that? Yeah, no, I hear it. Wow. Well, I wonder if. Okay. Well, then let's let's go on and talk about the really key scene. We can do away with the loss of Brother Franklin as he gets sliced up and cut straight to really the most important part of the entire movie, which is Sally is the last person. Sally gets away ostensibly from Leatherface and makes her way back to the gas station. Well, that's like the scariest scene to me. That part where they're being chased through the woods? Okay, yes. No, I mean, the, well, the, the the part where she's being chased through the woods is scary because, I mean, the idea of being chased some, by someone like Leatherface is scary. But, no, the the scene where she gets back to the gas station. She she's been rescued by the kindly gas station manager. And right. It, no, right, yeah, she's there. And and a slow, uh, oh, it is, no, it's it's harrowing. She seems to get away. I mean, she runs into Leatherface, and she runs, runs, runs. She gets back to the gas station. She thinks that she's safe. And, you know, very slowly, the illusion of safety just falls away because um, she first stares at the barbecue, which seems to have odd shapes to it. And then when the the guy who runs the, the barbecue joint and gas station with no gasoline comes back, He's clearly trying. He's about to capture her because he's he starts approaching her with a, with a burlap sack, and God, what, and he's an an incredibly. It's so weird because when he grabs her and starts driving with her, he is saying all these nice things to her, but he's also a sadist. So he's just poking her with. Like a, well, he beats a, her with a broom. Yeah, he beats her with a broom. broom. It's like, yeah. holy crap. All of it's like, jeez, man. <laughs> Just terrible. Yeah, yeah. No, he beats her terribly. But then when he's driving with her, it's this is even worse than when he's whacking her with the broom because he's trying to get her into the sack. When he's actually into in the car and driving her around, he's he's just brutally poking her with the broom as he's driving. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. I, I find the cook to be the scariest of the family because, for one, he's the most outwardly normal looking. I mean, he's still kind of strange looking, but not to the point that, he, you know, if you were to put him in a, in a, in a row of people, you wouldn't think he's not a freak like Leatherface. No. And he's not, yeah. you know, a space case like the Hitchhiker. The, the hitchhiker, right. uh, and the fact that he seems so aware, like, of 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 how wrong, like, you know, the the other two don't just seem to be have any awareness that what they're right. doing is wrong. There is like this, he knows it's wrong. He actually feels slightly remorseful about it, right, and still does it, right. Yeah, a man's yeah, got to do what, what a man's got to do. Yeah, it's what you have to do. You know, yeah. again, yeah. back to family traditions. It can't you know, be some helped. Some people that are and... the word. He says something like it can't be helped at some point, you know, <laughs> which – I'm sorry, Tony, I interrupted you. And welcome back. No, no. I was just saying, <laughs> you know, it's for some families that's stuffing and, you know, like yams with, with uh, marshmallows, but for this family it's, you know – all chairs with actual hands and yeah. feeding your grandpa blood. <laughs> whatever, whatever well, even the, the blood aspect of this, you know, they, they make reference, and, you know, and I even talked about it when we opened up, they make reference to Dracula, yeah. and, you know, the, which is, of course, the older tradition of horror, which, you know, in, in some cases this movie kind of flies in the face of, but there is that, that, underlining thing of, of vampirism in this movie and in many ways the, the chainsaw family is more like vampires from actual folklore than than anything we've seen in any actual vampire movies right yeah no that's 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 true that's true they're completely ghoulish 
and they're completely they've they've lost track entirely of of the way normal human community is supposed to work because all of this stuff is ridiculously profane we don't generally eat dinner with dinner you know you don't you you know we keep pets and animals that we're going to slaughter generally separate for instance all of this stuff is just really freaking weird you know we don't you know, so the idea that they would like, like, spend time with the person that they're that they're going to eat soon, is is just odd. I mean, all of it, all of it is is really odd, and and, and you know, it has, it's so uncontrolled and and zany that it has a sexual feel to it in a sense that they're out of control because they must do th- these things for like compulsive reasons. As well. well, and there's no women, right? Oh, well, that's a good point. There's no women. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, and by the way, having said all we said earlier about the culture war, uh, Leatherface is a crossdresser. Leatherface is a giant, uh, developmentally delayed, physically befo- deformed, enormous, overweight crossdresser who also murders people. I mean, and and he wears a woman face. Not only, this is very Ed Gein, which he paints up with makeup, you know, um, you know, and, and like lipstick and and stuff like that. And they put up with him, you know, in the manner of fam of a family that just puts up with. Well, everybody you know. has their their thing yeah. they do for the family, you know. Yeah. He takes care. Of, they, you know, they say he does the work. Yes. Right. Um, so everybody, yeah. you know, everything in its place. Everything has a place. And, uh, that's the way. That's the way it is in the in the Leatherface family. Well, yeah. And in fact, they, 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 you know, they, they capitalize the... that on on you know later ones where you know this saw his family is the tagline and stuff like that. But, well, they you they know. they you know, and they found a way, a very Sweeney Todd way, but a way nonetheless to exist in this this decimated. Yeah, world. You know, they they yeah. in a, in, you know as a business structure, it kind of works because it's like okay, there's the supply of of people coming along this road. Yeah, we kill a few of them, process them, make them in the barbecue, sell them back to other people. Yeah, Ugh. yeah, that's right. They seem to be a little clumsy though. There's a whole bunch of business with the fact that Franklin is often. Um, like spitting out bits of of gristle and 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 bone, um, you know that that you know either that or it's just business that Toby Hooper is putting in to remind us of just the physicality of eating barbecue. That there's there's stuff to it, you know, as opposed to you know normal time. A lot of times when you see people eating food in the movies, the food doesn't have any substance to it. Um, well, it's just, you know, oh, real, I, real barbecue, and even, I mean, I fried chicken today, and you still have to pick around the bones. I mean, even though it's a, a change, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, that's, yeah. I think, I think it's, a, it's kind of a cross because, you know, like you eat a good steak, you have to cut around the bone and stuff like, you know, t-bone, that's a good point. you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And so, well, yeah, I think it's bit. more about the rawness of it as, as far as like how you're getting the real deal kind of thing. You know, I think that's right. I think that's well, the fact that ahead, it sir. has to be bar. Like, there is no other thing that could have worked in this scheme too. It had because of the Texasness in play here it, culturally, like those 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 roadside bar, you know, places that are gas stations, but they also sell barbecue. That is a very Texas thing, and yeah. uh, just to the, the, the tie that back into it. Yeah. No, ab- absolutely. Um, I, I I'm fascinated by how how Hooper just continues to to remind us all the way through this thing of the realness of the deepness of of all the things he's showing. You always get the impression that if you if you took one of those pieces of meat off of one of those hooks in the in the barbecue that it would it would taste like real barbecue. You get the you get the impression that this house is real and that these people are real. You know, it's exactly what Rob Zombie was saying. You know, it really feels like you are just simply getting a chance for some reason to ride along as we discover these extraordinarily horrible people um, doing horrible things by now. Because this is the point where uh, Marilyn Burns 
gets carried into the house and begins really the hardest part of the night for her because they tie her up and they begin to do different things to her. They Interestingly, by the way, they never rape her. They never do anything sexual to her per se. Um, it is just a bunch of men terrorizing uh, this this woman who can't get away and and is in is in you know really terrible terrible distress. Um, I felt like it was actually surprising how little sex there was in this movie. I, I expected mm-hmm. it to be incredibly perverse, and it's weird, but it's not like kinky. No, you know? it's not. Except for I mean, it's not like we were talking about on the left. Yeah, no. Leatherface doesn't, you know, we're like, oh, he cross-dresses. But it's not in a kinky way. You're like, he just wants to look pretty for dinner. (laughs) I think that's true. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, there's there's this gentleness towards Leatherface's cross-dressing that there is gentleness towards nothing else in the movie. Um, But, yeah, nobody, nobody... I feel like he's the only redeemable character in the movie. Well, not the only character. I shouldn't say that. Out of the villains, though, he kind of reminds me of a redeemable villain. Like, you feel kind of bad for him. At least, well, okay, maybe that's not everyone. But when he, he's just surprised, you know, somebody's breaking into his house. Like, what is this guy doing here? And then he sees another one, you know, and he just throws his hands up and he's just like, whoa. You know, you just that is you really can funny. see it being like he kind of seems almost like a a housewife that is just like oh my. <laughs> like, yeah, like when the girl just, starts to escape from the freezer, he is really funny because he's like oh. But I mean, that's because he's truly crazy. I mean, he 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 doesn't. He's childlike. I don't think he has any real understanding of what in the world is going on. Well, he's been raised by these demented people, too. So, yeah. if, you know, wh- one could assume that he's possibly the, the result of inbreeding. I mean, <laughs> there there is, of course, that stereotype in play here. And, you know, yeah. he, <laughs> you I don't know. know. I think there'd have to be more women. I mean... Well, they only yeah, we show don't the one. I mean, you don't have any idea, like, well, I guess maybe you don't know how Grandma and Grandpa got to know each other, but, well, I, I mean, mean, isn't... Surely they, they had a mother. The mother is gone. The mother is not here. We don't know what happened to her, but surely they had one, you know, and, and I think they they may even have made reference to it. I can't remember. You know, the the the, the grandfather is way, way, way old. I mean, he's like like little big man old. Yeah, he's and, a mummy. <laughs> yeah. But he's, oh wait, the grandma is also mummified. She's just dead. But the grandpa is mummified, but he's still alive. And um we we come to learn that the grandfather used to be the greatest like uh cattle killer there ever was. You know, that he actually was an a, a really fast killer with a sledgehammer. Sixty <laughs> sixty in five minutes once. Right. <laughs> right. You know, would have gotten faster if the guys could have removed the cattle faster from the floor so he could get some more of them. Okay, so so that's who he is. But so this is this I can't imagine what in the hell Hooper was thinking when he came up with this because it's amazing. They decided it'd be fun if they let grandpa be the one to kill Sally. So they give him a hammer, but they have to try to figure out He's not strong enough, so they're doing all kinds of crazy things like well, try to. It's, yeah, it's also like the whole oh, let the man of the house carves the turkey. Yes, kind of yes. thing. So it's again back to tradition of well, Grandpa should have the kill. Like yes. if we're gonna kill her, we should let because he's the patriarch, of course. Yes. Well, well he, they, you know, it's abusive as <laughs> they. Is as abusive as the brothers are to each other, and they're very abusive. And in fact, you know, the cook is incredibly mean to Leatherface. They yeah. all revere Grandpa. Well, that's a fairly, I mean, and that's a fairly traditional family thing. It's such a weird, ah, there's, there's a whole, you could do a whole thesis on the stru- family structure yes. of Chainsaw Massacre family, the Leatherface <laughs> family. Could be a whole thesis. Well, the, 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 I think the family, you know, we, we talked about Leatherface's influence on other horror characters, and certainly, you know, we see it in Michael Myers and Jason 
and, you know, subsequent other slasher characters, the family is really what makes him stand out because it, it puts it into the same territory as, like, you know, older films like The Old, the old Dark House yeah. or uh, Spider Baby, uh, where you have this demented clan. And, it, you know, it really... The family aspect of this is what makes it so, so interesting and you know you could yeah you could write like books on this stuff yes i mean it has a feel of comedy when 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 we're seeing the brothers he means one another but also clowning around you know um several times the cook makes a big deal about how leatherface sawed through the door when he was chasing them in look what your brother did to the door and he hits it again later on he goes goes you messed up the front door and they're all of this business is, you know, truly, it, it has the feel of, of what's intended to be sort of a corn pone country comedy. Um, well, it's kind of funny. We've been watching, uh, Jamie and I have been watching Arrested Development, and some of the way the brothers interact in this movie is not too dis- too dissimilar <laughs> from the way the Blues brothers interact with each other. That's funny. That's uh, um and I've only seen parts. I, I'm ashamed to say I've only seen like a couple of rest of developments along the way, but I completely identify. Well, yeah, because you've got the one like straight one, which is Jason Bateman. Who you're saying is like the cook. Is the totally? Are you saying that Leatherface is like what's his name, the bald guy who lost his hand? I would say Leatherface out of the Blues family would definitely be Buster. Jamie, do you, th- yeah, do you yeah. agree with that? <laughs> I would go with that. Um. Well, if you're only considering it to be the three of them, I mean, it's got to be, you know, the father. I mean, but yeah, I guess because Job would have to be the the knight, the hitchhiker. So, I mean, Buster, I mean, you can't really count Tobias. <laughs> he's yeah. not technically a brother. He's a brother-in-law. Well, uh, kind well of, on, you know, yeah, An Yang yeah. is too young to really factor in. Okay, but to get, a, I think that's a wonderful thought. But uh, but we'll have to give well, it some more. Also, also by the way, though, it you know talking about how weird it is. Like it all, it reaches a watching it again. Some of the parts where Leatherface is just kind of wandering around and emoting, it almost takes on a, a kind of absurdist yeah. tone in a way that I hadn't really noticed before. It's this such a weird juxtaposition because he's yelling and. The kind of grunting and making all these really guttural sounds and screeches and everything, and he's so distraught. And it, it's a weird, like, wow, where's this coming from? That you know, also you know, you can see the influence eventually on say like trauma films, yeah. uh, definitely influenced by this kind of like low budget filmmaking, you know, especially when you start with you know Toxic Avenger, which had a also a same we're gonna go for broke before trauma became the trauma brand and hey we're going to do this because that's what makes a trauma film it was this like we're going to make a something that goes for broke you know i and, i could boy i will agree with you about toxic avenger people forget how how just brutal toxic avenger was yeah um, and it, it was played more for, uh, you know more for comedy more for absurdism but you know and then once Leatherface finally, you know, he, granted, he's cut himself by the end. He's cut himself in the leg, and he's yeah. just so distraught that the victim got away, and he's wandering around in the streets just swinging. Well, we should, we should, we should go to that because I, I know we got to wrap up about this. After the har, basically, what enables Sally to get away because she really thinks she's not going to get away, and she is just completely trapped. And and we spend a, like five full minutes dealing with her just screaming and feeling lost. And then because they start to get clever with, with letting Grandpa take a whack at her skull, where so she really has to go through some pain there because they do hit her in the head, that is her moment. They're screwing around being funny that way, and she takes that moment to get away and leaps right out the door, and then there's a chase. And, and you really are invested in seeing this girl pump it down the, uh, the road and like down the, the entry to the farm and out to what amounts to a larger road where vehicles are passing by. And Leatherface is still chasing her with a chainsaw. Um, 
that then and you know the final shot is well you know, you know I, I mean she he attacks like a truck the trucker <laughs> gets out you know hits um you know trucker hits the the hitchhiker if I'm not mistaken right yeah the he runs like, over the hitchhiker runs, oh runs God, over you know, the younger yeah. brother trucker gets out holy crap and then all of a sudden down the road comes guy with a chainsaw <laughs> right <laughs> so they're running they flag down a guy who you think would just like pull around because he looks like you know another truck comes by she's trying to flag him down he gets to see this tableau of stop truck run over dude chainsaw guy bloody girl truck Trucker, <laughs> trucker running, running around. Well, running the out. trucker like, throws a wrench at Leatherface. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Leatherface yeah. falls over and actually saws his own leg a little yeah. bit, which I yeah. think is great. And that's something we would never get in any. Right. You know, Leatherface is, is is portrayed as so unstoppable in in yeah. some of the the you know the subsequent chainsaw films, and sure. you know the fact that because a chainsaw really would make a clumsy weapon in a lot of respects, and so seeing that little bit of reality to me is 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 kind of nice. Absolutely. Well, also, so guy who looks like he's gonna not stop <laughs> and he's just passing by actually does a Yui. You know, she hops in the back, and I love also because the trucker just keeps going. <laughs> he right. doesn't even try to get in the truck. <laughs> as far as we know, by the end of it, that dude he's heading toward to Austin. Yeah. He might be there. Like he's being chased because he, you know, he stops. He gets hit. He's like, oh my god, I hit somebody. Oh look! And there's a guy with a chainsaw who's like chainsawing his truck and stuff, you know? Yes. Like, and so he, I just noticed I had to rewind it because I was like, wait, "Wait, the trucker? Oh, he's just he's hoofing it. He yeah, he's on the way to He's not going to stop until he reaches, you know, I don't know, Liberty Lunch or something. So yeah. <laughs> and she hops in the back, and you know, the guy in doing the Yui kills his truck and has to like restart it. So yes. other faces. Oh my God, him. the truck dies. And so the, so the, the pickup truck has to actually restart it. That I totally forgotten about that. There's more suspense there. And then, yeah, once it starts moving, I love her, just her, I, I, I don't even know how to put it. Her triumphant yelp when she yeah. is being driven away. <laughs> If we did it now, she'd be flipping him off or something. But now her elation of like, screw you, I got away. And well, little I think, I think dancing in the in the street. Rawr, the one Marilyn, that got away. Marilyn Burns deserves a lot of credit in this movie because I think, and rest in peace, by the way. I, I think yeah. we, we, we Marilyn, yeah. Marilyn Burns recently died, so I think that probably deserves That's mentioning. Yeah, absolutely. But. Uh, she very realistically conveys shock. Mm-hmm. You know, she never, while well, she doesn't come across as, as a weak person by any stretch of the imagination, she never turns into an action hero. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It, it feels, I mean, again, you know, props, it, it, the movie for the most part feels very real, and it's yeah. because of those performances like that. Um, you know, and she's... The, all panicked, and they have those up close shots of her eyeball. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, yeah, yeah. Looking around, and you can see like the little flecks of dirt in her eye, and just stuff like that. And the dirty rag—I felt like of all things that made me cringe. The dirty rag that they just stuffed into her mouth oh. when uh, the the cook <laughs> gets to her, and after yeah. beating her with the broom, like that part is just like, oh, it grossed me out. And I, I know, like in watching the behind the scenes footage and, you know, listening to her talk about, you know, having to do that. That was just some really dirty rag that they just found. And they just, you know, <laughs> use that throughout the rest of the shooting. She was like, from the moment that, that nasty rag is put into her mouth, she had to keep that in there until at least the end of that weird eyeball shoot and until she gets outside. So that's pretty. By the way, she has beautiful green time. eyes. I mean, her her mm-hmm. eyes are just the most brilliant emeralds you've ever seen. But yeah, I mean, oh, oh, she suffers. They cut they cut this poor actress's finger. Literally cut her finger. I I can't. I it just seems like you know you're not a, the. I mean, there's there are minders who will make sure that you don't hurt animals, but somehow it's okay on a on a shoot that they're like, you know, we can't get the blood knife to work. You know, you have a, a hollow, hollow point knife that 
spurts out a little bit of blood. So they literally just go, okay, we're going to cut your finger. And, and, and so she went along with it. I can't believe this girl went along with the crap that they put her through in this movie. Um, did she comment? How did she feel about this movie later in her life? Uh, I haven't watched enough she, of the documentaries to, I guess, I mean. She, it seemed like from the documentary that Jamie and I watched that she was relatively proud of the movie. I mean, I would. Yeah. I would. I've no. I've never read anything specifically from her, and I'd love to find out more. I've read, read lots of stuff from people working on the movie. Otherwise, who were like, that thing was torture to go through, and it was a hell of a lot of work, and it was ugly and hot and smelly. And, and well, uh, the thing that we learned is, unfortunately, for the people that worked on the movie, uh, they didn't make anything. Yeah, the distributor were the distributors were mafiosos, and uh, they they kept all the money themselves. Well, also, I mean, they didn't even know for if it was going to be even able to be distributed. <laughs> like, they're like, this thing, I don't know, man. You know, you guys have made this. We don't know if this is coming out. I mean, because I mean, Hooper is an artist, and... but I think it's possible that people could not have necessarily predicted that this movie was going to become as big a deal uh, as it, as it did. Um, I mean, I, again, I think he's bringing stuff to this that, you know, no, nobody would expect. I think he brings a lot more. Look, I mean, I, I kind of just like, so like that last shot of, of Leatherface mm-hmm. just flipping out. Yeah. Like there's just, and you know, maybe that's because, you know, we've said it, Tony keeps saying it, the legend of this movie like yeah. that seems so much like a pop culture icon being born, you know, it's, right there. It's amazing as he's going, he's pirouetting in the middle of a highway, you know, and spinning around with that uh, that chainsaw up in the air, and then it just it, it does a shot cut, you know, it doesn't like fade out or anything. It just goes bang. Um, you're right. I mean, it's but having said that, uh, okay, so yes. He is way talented. If you were talking earlier about Herschel Gordon Lewis. Herschel Gordon Lewis brought, I mean, there was a zest to his movies, but there wasn't a great deal of what I would call artistry. I mean, you know, they they were woodenly acted. You know, they're 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 often like they're way more gory than this. This is a, a much artier movie. Having said all that, it is the movie that it is, and I think. These guys making this may have thought that there was about as much likelihood that this would be a big hit as any of a number of other student films that they were probably doing constantly, because they were drama people. You know, these are these are like um, these are University of Texas drama students by and large, and um, you know, and crew and all that stuff. I think they did expect to get paid, and I think once the thing got to be a big hit, they were probably damn bitter that they weren't getting any money off of that. I think in the end they got like $9,000 to split between everybody or something, just some ridiculously tiny um, piece for everybody, cast and crew in, involved. Um, but that brings us to the end of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So we should get, my God, this is a long episode, and I apologize to the listener. <laughs> but uh, we, should, um, we should get our final thoughts and then uh, do endorsements. So what was the order that we went in? It was um, uh, it was Tony, Jamie, Drew, and uh, you know I'll say anything if there's anything left. So Tony, final thoughts: Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I think I think this is you know definitely an important movie in discussing modern horror, um, especially. Um, it's a lot more artsy than people remember. It's also a a lot less gory even though it is extremely disturbing because the two can, you know, as we've discovered with, you know, things like the haunting, you don't need gore to make it scary (laughs) or disturbing. And I think this does a really pretty amazing job of being uh, disturbing without being gory. It feels very realistic. Um, You know, I think we can probably, while it was made popular by things like, uh, Blair Witch. I think we can say that a lot of the found footage that we, what we think of as found footage, I think we can probably say was also probably influenced by this and its grittiness and you know close-ups and how it's shot and how it feels. Um, definitely, I think influenced a lot of filmmakers as well. 
So it's really cool to, to to do this movie. I mean, we could this is yet another one we could do several episodes yeah. um, because of how important it is. Um, and it's pretty amazing because it is kind of non traditional in its pacing and what we think of as a horror movie and movies in general. Um, but it it sowed the seeds for so much other stuff um, and, you know, bore a horror icon, of course, from that. Um, you know, it's it's really cool. I, it's definitely one, because of its disturbing nature, I don't watch it a lot. And I, like I said before, I was really a latecomer to it uh, just because, I, you know, I think a lot of people um, don't want to see it because their impression of what it is is different from what act, what the movie actually is. Um, due in part to the name as well as like, hey, there's a thing, a guy named Leatherface with a chainsaw, you know, oh, I don't think I want to see that. Um, and so I, I, I tell people, you know, we, I think we've gone over before, it's a lot different movie than I think the impression is of it, you know. And now yeah. there's a remake. I haven't even seen the remake, so. I, I hate the time. remake. I hate it so much. It is, uh, you know, people talk about, Michael Bay ruining their childhood with what he did to Transformers. Well, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was part of my childhood, so screw you, Michael Bay. <laughs> yeah, I just I haven't had the wherewithal to see it, you know. And you know, it's I mean, it's got the same cinematographer, you know, and he was like, "Hey, I, you know, it's a job. I, I sure. need to work." <laughs> this is, you know, they ask him. Um, you know, we captured. Uh, that on, you know, I captured it at House Core Horror Festival again. Thanks to them for, you know, having the podcast people there. That was really cool. Thanks. But, uh, you know, we captured a, a huge chunk of the panel, uh, which is on our Castle of Horror YouTube page, which people can, so, you know, as an addendum to this podcast, yeah. they can check that out. Um, but yeah, I'm glad we covered it. And I think it's really a really important film in, in horror. Um, it's, you know, again, one of those movies that you, can't get made now um just through uh, for a variety of reasons but uh very seminal and very uh a very different film than i think most people's impression of it is you know just from the title and pictures it's funny you should point out how difficult it would be to get it made because toby hooper said something about it that if he were to make it from scratch and i have not seen the remake but that's there would be way more exposition explaining all these people and their backstories and all that stuff. Whereas he yeah, we so skillfully, well, he gives it to us. All you really need is a few lines of dialogue to get to, yeah. to pick up on the backstories of these characters. You know, if you trust viewers to be able to, to, to pay attention. Um, Jamie, final thoughts, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Well, I have to say it's definitely worth a watch. Um, not only for, and on an entertainment and value, but uh, you know, just for the experience. Uh, like I said, I do like all the the extra thoughts people have put into it. Um, you know the, you know, what does this mean aspects, which probably weren't meant by the director in the first place. But you know, it's nice to uh, hint that you know what he might have actually thought. But. Um, like I said, way more artistic than uh, I had initially given it credit for, and you know, it's definitely worth a watch. I would say, but you know, I'm not totally for people letting their kids watch it at a very young age. I have to say, um, that's yeah. I mean, in spite of my husband's upbringing, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't want to, you know, expose my future child to that uh, at any point in time, you know, well, I say any point in time, you know, once they're old enough, but, and once they're driving, so I can scare them half to death about not picking up hitchhikers, you know, but, <laughs> or becoming barbecue. But yeah, no, it's, I, I, like I said, I actually enjoy the the movie and I'm looking forward to watching the second one. And actually I do remember even though I never saw the first one, watching the one with Renee Zellsberger and Matthew McConaughey on Showtime <laughs> no. when I was a kid. Yeah, that was something that my parents were, they didn't want me to see, but I remember seeing like parts of it and them t- very quickly turning it off. But I remember very well, like, like they were going on their way to the prom or something along those lines. But that was my first uh, little 
taste of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So, yeah, was um, like yeah. Did you ever imagine you would be living in Texas? No, at that point no. <laughs> I never thought that. That's what I was saying about you know earlier. My when moving down here, and no offense, Drew, <laughs> moving with you, <laughs> my parents were quite uh, concerned when they saw that you were from Texas. And a butcher, so right. <laughs> you know. Not to mention you think that's because of the Texas your interest in the horror movies. But I, I think that probably helped the stigma <laughs> behind the movie. So help you know fuel their their fear that you might be a serial killer. So. <laughs> but so, unfortunately, but they're wrong. I almost said wrong, unfortunately babe. they're wrong. Yeah, <laughs> way to prove them wrong, babe. <laughs> Yeah, the, the great thing is you have so far to go from that expectation. You know, you, you, you it's true. All... <laughs> um, you know, he, he managed to not be a serial killer and not be in the Navy in spite of him having so many tattoos, according to my mom. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So. Well, she also thought I was too good looking to be straight. So overly <laughs> tattooed. Wow. But too good. That's hilarious. That's uh, yeah. The funny thing is, when I think of you, Drew, I don't think of I, I don't think of you as being heavily tattooed. But then there there we go. So all right. Um, okay. Uh, well, actually, Drew, it's you. So again, you brought this movie to us, and I'm really glad you did. Um, final thoughts, text chains I'm asking. Well. Uh, this is a this is a classic. It's it's you know it's called a cult classic. I think it's beyond that at this point. This is just a, this is just a classic. And Leatherface, it has to be said, is a a true folk hero actually in Texas. You know I I don't see any other fictional characters, particularly in the horror genre, really treated the way. Leatherface is treated. People just love Leatherface in this state. And, you know, I've always had a certain affinity for him myself. So, I, I you know, when you when you brought up doing horror films from the 70s, particularly horror films that involved hippies, um, this, is, this is the first movie I thought of, even though there are many, many movies that fill that bill. And it has to be said, this is the greatest in my opinion, the greatest exploitation movie ever made and probably the only hick horror film that's worth talking about at the end of the day, although there are other ones that I enjoy. Uh, this is this is, this is is a great movie, and I, I've enjoyed this discussion quite a bit. You know, I, I feel like that this is... This has been one of the, the better episodes we've had in a long while, and, you know, I, I know it's been a lengthy one, but uh, hopefully people will, will take something out of it. Outstanding. Um, I really don't have anything to add, and I often say that, but, uh, but I don't. Great job, everybody. I really enjoyed talking about this movie, and I, I want to hear what people say. So let's do endorsements. Um, all right, Tony, what do you have for us this week? What can you recommend to the listeners that they may um, come across? Let's see. I've been watching, oh, I saw last night a film, not for everyone, <laughs> uh, definitely, but done really well if it's if you're into kind of meta stuff, uh, Birdman with Michael Keaton, uh, which oh, has gotten okay. a limited release, but really great, you know, movie within shooting a play, a, a lot about our blockbuster system and the differences between the Broadway scene and and Hollywood, there's a lot at play in Birdman, um, and that's why I say like it's not going to be for everyone. I thought it was pretty brilliantly done though. Um, Keaton gets some of his best performances. It's 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 really great. A great ensemble cast. Really interesting way that they mixed in uh, the soundtrack, which is mostly drums. Um, kind of running a counterpoint and then punctuating the scenes. Uh, it's hard to describe when you, when you watch it. It's really, really effective. Um, I also just found out there's a band uh, from Austin in the heavy scene called The Well, and they're on tour, and they had their band broken into, and luckily their gear was not stolen, but a lot of other stuff was. 
put and in that's $2. super yeah. sucks. And I will post the link. Um, they have a GoFundMe link that people have set up to help them kind of get because they're on the road. And you know, Jamie can understand how that is. Except mm-hmm. now they have to worry about also, uh, you know, replacing a computer and their, you know, luggage and all kinds of stuff while on the road while trying to, you know, and lots of money, you know, almost two grand, which isn't maybe a lot in the grand scheme of things, but it is when you're on the road and it is when you're an indie artist. So I'll post that link because I think that's super crappy, uh, you know, for a band that's kind of picking up steam and, you know, they're really good. I like the, I like their music a lot. Um, seen them a lot around town. Um, and this is one of the, one of their first like major tours. So mm. if you have, you know, if that's what you want to help out with, you know, again, music is near and dear to our heart here, especially me and, you know, I'm sure Jamie, Jimmy. like I said, can yeah. understand. Um, <laughs> and Drew is in the music scene too. Um, I'll, I'll post that, but I just, I saw that and I think, wow, that's, I can only imagine, you know, it's, and it's having crazy. having somebody having had somebody break into my house and, you know, steal stuff. I, you know, at all, anytime something like that happens, it kind of floods back. So, um, I'll post that link uh, tonight, and you know, if that's something that you can help out with, uh, I'm sure they would appreciate it. So. Wow. Okay. Um, no, thank you. That's that's, and I was I was shocked by that story. The second, you know, it, it's fun, so funny to me that in pop culture, um, we love thieves so much, and yet, you know, stealing is the 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 pain that it causes a regular person when they lose something valuable. You know, is is so profound, and and I often feel really really terrible. Of, you know. Yeah, I I. I... I'm torn a lot, and especially after getting robbed and torn a lot, because I really do love heist movies. Yes. But the violation and scared, you know, like I had just, when I had stuff stolen, I had just put down the deposit for our first album for Deserts of Mars yeah. and was extremely lucky. They didn't take my gear, but they could have. You know, yeah. my thoughts immediately were, is my wife safe? Are my cats safe? Is my mu- are my instruments say in, in rapid succession, and you know I was really torn. Like I thought about it for a while. I mean, pay to, you know, payback is one of my favorite movies, and he's a terrible person. He steals, you know, money and all this stuff, and it's it's I don't know. I I haven't always reconciled that post being well, robbed. Other than heist movies are kind of you know it's a different thing, but heist but, uh, movies are really, usually stealing from an enormous company. But I mean, sure. still, the, yeah, that's that's a lot to think about. I had a friend, by the way, who was in a car accident, and she's fine. But she posted. This is somebody from high school. She posted uh, that she and her husband were in a in a uh, head-on collision, and Ooh. both went to the hospital. But what was the astonishing thing was, people who came out to their car after the accident, somebody reached in and stole her purse from <laughs> the front seat of the car. I oh, cannot bastards. imagine. Just can't imagine. Who would do something like that? It, That's that, horrible. It, it's completely no, it's, terrible people. I subhumans. Guess. I would. I would say that that that's a subhuman at that point. Like, yeah. I mean, truly opportunistic. Like those. That that's that's a monster. That's that a is monster. a monster. The the you know when we talk about monsters, that thing yeah. is a monster. Yes. Yeah. I, I I agree with you completely. Um, Jamie. Um, on that downward thought, so <laughs> what, um, what What about you in terms of endorsements this week? Well, um, for my – I always – whenever I come on, I always plug some sort of event first and then something I like uh, seeing. Um, so I'll keep with that. And uh, for my event, um, if on December 13th in – Austin, Texas, if you're in the the area. Um, if you have a classic car, even better. But Culver's up, up north on Breaker Lane is putting on a car show for Toys for Tots. Danger Cakes will be playing. So bring a toy, you know, bring 10 bucks if you want to enter a car. And just bring the family. They'll be giving out free ice cream and hot chocolate and 
there'll be raffles and prizes for I think there's ten different categories for vehicle and you know, it all goes for a good cause and you know there's a lot of kids out there who don't have uh you know families making enough money to buy them toys this holiday season so it's uh you know all of our duties to do our part and get out there and help so um this is one way you can spread some holiday cheer you said that's and, the 13th uh, by the way december 13th yeah cool. So it'll be fun. And uh, I say free ice cream. I'll get in trouble because they have free custard. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Very There's a difference. difference. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I think that's cool because, like, Rain and I, uh, you know, don't have kids, aren't having kids. But I, we often give to, you know, charities like that. And, you know, I kind of like going to KB or wherever and shopping and going, hey, what would I get, you know? What would I get a kid who doesn't have anything? Like, what would they like? And like, I kind of enjoy that shopping, actually. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's fun to you know, like I said, and to know that it's going to go to someone who really will appreciate yeah, it. Exactly, and exactly. Truly love it. Um, and then on my recommendations and endorsements for something I've seen, um, I'm going to have to go with the taking of Deborah Logan. Um, I've was recently I don't know I've I've been on a horror kick lately and uh, I saw this movie on Netflix and I have to say it it's a low budget horror movie I wasn't exactly expecting it to be good but it was and it's a little bit more disturbing than uh, I expected it to be well I shouldn't have said I didn't expect it to be ex- disturbing it starts off with a basically kind of like a documentary style film about a woman who has Alzheimer's or uh-huh. so you think. And so there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of dealing with, um, you know, this woman and her daughter as she, you know, has to move back home and live with her mother to take care of her and their strained relationship and watching a parent age and, you know, seeing anyone who's had a relative kind of go downhill um, and, and, you know, lose their mind in, in that sort of fashion and lose their, their memories. Um, it's it's upsetting and disturbing. But then you add a whole other layer of weird by throwing some paranormal shit on top. So oh. it was, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty, uh, it's pretty intense at times. There's some scenes where, uh, you know, she just gets so crazy. She rips her own face off. So <laughs> yeah, stuff like that you wouldn't expect. Um, but so it's sort of a possession like, film. It's an Alzheimer's slash possession movie, basically? Yes. Yes. Oh. So you're like, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, you <laughs> no, know, it's, it's, next it's, it's, time you're thinking cool. about Grandma, <laughs> maybe it's not her fault at all. <laughs> so. that's, oh, wow. What a great idea. What That's that's really thinking about, you know, what are people grappling with today that I can turn into something? That's cool. Yeah, uh, and they actually turned it, and it's, you know, it's not only like a talk about that, but, you know, the there's this whole other subplot going on between the mother and the daughter and their strained relationship because the daughter was is a, or is a lesbian and so she's kind of got this way of, you know, not having that, unex, that unexpressed emotions there that, you know, kind of build resentment and, you know, you feel so much for the characters because you just want them to be able to have that calmness you know and that peace with that comes with confession and um and that doesn't really happen <laughs> so, but it's it's good i don't know it's, it was an interesting movie so that was the it's called the taking of deborah logan so on Netflix. deborah with an h d-o-b-r-a-h yes. um well drew what do you have for us this week well um on Tony's suggestion from a few weeks back, I, I watched uh, In Bitching, which is a, a Spanish oh, yeah. horror comedy. And I, I, 
I quite enjoyed it. It's not it's not perfect. It's very uh, juvenile in some yeah. of its humor, <laughs> but it yeah, yeah. it totally does bring to mind like early Peter Jackson and you know early Sam Raimi. You know, it, it captures that kind of feel pretty pretty well. And uh, you know, I I would think if you're looking for a horror comedy, you know, there's so few ones that are actually good. This this one's pretty, this one's pretty good. But you know, along those same lines, the real thing, the really thing that lit up my life this week was uh, the return of epic rap battles of history to YouTube. Oh, yeah, I saw a, one of those came back, and I was like, ah, oh, bet Drew. Like I instantly <laughs> thought of Drew. It is. It is this week. Genre fans rejoice. This week we finally get to see Mythbusters versus Ghostbusters. Oh, sorry. and I, they did a really good job. I, you could tell that they they put a lot of effort into this one. They got really spot, with the exception of the guy playing Winston. All of the guys playing the Ghostbusters actually do look quite a bit like the actors from Ghostbusters. They did a good job with all the Mythbusters uh, characters as well. There's a lot of wonderful references to the movie Ghostbusters. And and, and actually, I think the best line, the thing that really sold me over it was uh, that that Walter Walter Peck was in fact right and the Ghostbusters were no doubt up to some shady shit. (laughs) But... There's also an amazing cameo at the end of the the rap battle, which any Ghostbusters fan will will be bound to love. So, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the series, and oddly, I'm not even that big of a, of a rap fan. I'm I'm kind of, you know, kind of passive about rap. Like I can't really tell you much after a certain you know, era of rap is over. Like I, I literally, like I couldn't even begin to tell you about any modern rap, but I love epic rap battles of history. I, 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 and they're, they're doing a, they're doing a, a new one every Monday, I believe. So there, there probably is actually a new one tonight. Uh, but right now I'm endorsing Ghostbusters versus Mythbusters. And I will definitely post that to the, uh, the Facebook page. So uh, okay, I promise you that I will watch that. I um, did anybody watch? Um, I had a book that I wanted to promote, but I'm gonna I'm gonna literally endorse the same thing for a second week in a row. Did anybody watch Too Many Cooks? Or did everybody yeah. watch Too Many Cooks? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole backlash about that thing too, and I'm not part of that. I think it's pretty. I think it's pretty awesome, but it's brilliant. And I I'm dying to hear. Basically, the 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 fact is, this is not me being cynical. Anytime something gets really popular, it reaches this point where people start writing blogs against it. There's backlash because people know that that's a way to get your blog post read. You know, you, you posted that thing about the guy talking about Big Bang, Big Bang Theory. It was and I disliked that show yeah. for a lot of the same reasons that that person was writing about. But mm-hmm. I feel like if you have to put the energy – to actually writing an essay about how much you dislike something that's popular, yeah. you have already failed yourself on well, some was, That was actually, yeah, I'm, uh, this is, so, so yeah, first of all, Too Many Cooks, you should watch it. It's every bit, of, every bit as interesting as people say. But, yeah, um, th- there was an article this past week, so this is my anti-endorsement. I guess you should read this and then see how you feel. Maybe that's the problem. I don't know. Well, it's because you were talking about backlashes of things that were popular. Yes. That's what and, 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 yeah, um, so Big Bang Theory. Well, but there's been, there's been a number of backlash articles against Big Bang Theory. Um, Salon ran one by a, a woman who says, she goes, I like trash TV okay. You know, I, I enjoy watching the Kardashians, which is interesting because I have never seen the Kardashians. I don't know what that's about. But... Um, the, she goes, but I watched this this Big Bang Theory. Um, apparently, it's been on for a number of years. I don't know who any of these people are. The jokes didn't make me laugh. I was kind of confused most of the time. I don't really understand why this was popular. What's that about? That was the whole article. That was it. <laughs> it's, it's just the weirdest thing. <laughs> I was like, how can you have paid somebody to rag on a sitcom you've never seen, have no interest in? Well, that's just it. I really, really dislike that show, 
but I will will never put the energy into writing a whole essay about it. That is ludicrous to me. Do something more constructive with your talent. I I, I agree with you that I've often thought, you know, when when I get a hold of something for a review, right, if I don't like it, to be perfectly honest with you, I just don't write the review. I mean, I... Yeah, that's how I ran when I I did the Calling Manga Island column. I chose things I liked and I chose to spread it. I've... I am not. I would not be good at being a critic. I mean, we do it on the show. You know, we'll give short shrift to some things, but yeah. in general, in my writing, I just didn't have it in me, man. Like, I just well, not I, I like really. Enjoy, I like enjoying things. Right. You know, yeah. I, I, you know, I don't. I've had to train myself to really look at things critically through the process of doing the show. You know, like I, my, I. That's not a something that came by, I, I came by naturally, and I'm, I'm sure that's probably true with the three of you as well. I think I think that's true. I think I'm more free to be um, critical than I once was. Uh, you know, still, generally, we only have so much time, right? So let's say you're doing an essay a week or an essay a day or whatever. The fact is, there's enough for you to point people to that is worth talking about that you like that you don't really have to take time that was bizarre. I really completely had no understanding of, of of that. Now, there have also been some interesting geeks who have written articles about how they don't like the Big Bang Theory because they think it misrepresents this or that thing. And I think that that is an essay that has uh, it has stronger legs to stand on because they're really interested in in talking about why they don't like the show from a very specific reason, other than. I don't know. I'm just this person who watches the Kardashians, and I'm not sure what this show is about. <laughs> and it's been on for seven years or whatever, and so I don't know who any of these people are, and the in jokes are lost on me. That's <laughs> why. Why would you write that article? <laughs> it's so crazy. Anyway, so too many cooks still giving me nightmares. I, I love it, and also go over to Salon to admire the hardness of this particular review of a show I don't watch either. I actually don't watch the Big Bang Theory myself. Um, so, because really, truly, I don't make much time for anything that's like within the last 20 years. It's very sad. Um, okay. Jesus, God, this is like one of the longest. I, I really appreciate everybody for sticking around. I think it was worth it. I think we had a great conversation about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, leave us reviews on iTunes. I'm serious. If you're listening to the show on iTunes, take a moment, say something, say anything. We would love to read it. We read every one of the reviews. Come to the Facebook page, Castle of Horror Podcast. We totally want to engage with what you have to say and what your responses are. We live for that stuff. And um, uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for being on. And um, we will see you next week. I think we're going to watch the uh, really incomprehensible horror movie, The Terror. So um, thanks, everybody. We will see you soon. Bye. Thanks. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.